My name's Jeannie Wasco. Jacobs was my maiden name. And I was born on the Camas Prairie here um, in Cottonwood at the hospital. My parents lived in Nespers, uh, Rita and Larry Jacobs. And so I grew up here on a farm about three miles out of town. Uh, my mom was the oldest girl in her family. And my dad was kind of a rebel when he was in high school. He ran away from home and went and joined the uh, rodeo circuit. He and my mom got married on March 4th, 1946. There were six of us, and um, I was the oldest. So after me, my brother Rich, and then my brother Milt, and then my brother Jim, and then my sister Donna, and my sister Sharon is the youngest. She's 12 years younger than I am. I said, when I was five, my life changed. We got a new car, a baby brother, and a television. And I'm like, the new car was great. We could get to town. The baby brother, not so good because I already had two brothers, but the TV, that was. And I said, I did not like to watch cartoons. I liked to watch the news. And my mom told me that she would say, Jeannie, come and set the table. And I said, no, I'm watching Edward R. Murrow and the news. I can't. My brothers, they did the farm work, so I didn't have to. I helped mom make lunches for, um, to, to the harvest field. Um, that sort of thing. Every Sunday we had to go fishing. My mom would make a picnic lunch. She always got the, the hard jobs. And we'd pile in the car. My dad uh, made a, uh, he took a piece of plywood and cut it out to fit the back seat. And so he'd put it over the back seat so the kids, we could kind of play on there in the back seat while we went to look for a fishing spot. Well, at that time, the only way to get to Kamii and to the good fishing places was down the old Kamii grade, one lane grade. Yeah, and that was not pleasant. I was actually in two wrecks on that grade. So we'd go to Kamii, stop at the store, the gas station probably, and buy some pop. And that was before Pepsi was popular. So we bought grape knee-high, orange knee-high, and cream soda. Those were the, the, that was the treat to buy pop to take on. And then we'd go up the river, drive up the Clearwater River. And that was before Highway 12 was completed so that they were working on it. So every Sunday we would drive up to wherever Highway 12 stopped, you couldn't go clear through to Montana, to wherever Highway 12 stopped, then turn around and come to one of the creeks, and that's where we'd have our picnic and go fishing. There were no counselors then to help you figure out what you wanted to do. And in my mind, a woman could become a housewife, which like, pfft, no. Um, a nurse, no. A secretary, and I'm like, eh. So um, I went to school and became a teacher. And it was just kind of like, you know, it happened. You just kind of going along and doing whatever. And I went to the U of I with really no expectations other than I was going to college. Um, that's where I met Mike. My brother was a year behind me and my brother lived in Galt Hall. Mike had lived in Galt Hall. And Mike, who is also a social butterfly, loved to answer the telephone in Galt Hall, which was out in the hallway. So he would answer the phone. If I happened to call my brother, he would engage me in conversation for a half an hour. <laughs> so we knew each other by phone. And then um, Mike had gone to school at Linfield College for a couple of years on a baseball scholarship, and then he dropped out and came to Idaho. And so he had a girlfriend from Linfield that came to visit. And lo and behold, she stayed with a girl I knew in our dorm. So the first time I actually saw Mike, he was coming to visit his girlfriend from Linfield. <laughs> and I must say, he looked rather studly. So then it turns out we ended up being in some of the same classes, like a lot of psych classes and, and whatnot. And pretty soon, he was asking me to go study with him. 
no dates, just let's go study together. So we'd go to the library. Or Finally, he did ask me out on a date. And this was kind of what defined our marriage. Um, he didn't show up. We were supposed to go see The Sound of Music. He didn't show up. Where was he? He was in the hospital because he sprained his ankle playing basketball. So whether it's basketball, that's his favorite, I guess, and baseball or whatever, um, yeah, he, he takes that over. Anything else. Usually I took extra classes in case I might want to drop one because I'm that kind of person to look ahead. and So I always took extra classes, but I never dropped one. I guess at the end of my junior year, I figured out I'm going to have enough credits to graduate. So I'm like, well, I think I'll just look around and see if there's any jobs out there for English teachers. And I'd taken some library science classes too. At New Meadows, they needed an English teacher slash librarian. And so I went down there, interviewed, and got the job. So I moved to New Meadows in the January of 1969. At the end of that semester, uh, Mike had graduated and they needed a biology teacher, so they hired him to teach biology. So for the next year and a half, so for two years, we were at New Meadows. And I loved it. It was great. We'd been going back to get our master's degrees during the summertime. And then we decided, eh, let's go back to school and finish up our master's degrees and see what happens. So we did. We went for a year, um, got our master's degrees. When we moved to Moscow, we were looking for a place to live. And our, my, our friend, who was the other English teacher and a little bit older than I, um, said, well, we lived in the basement of this professor, and maybe you guys could live in their basement, too. So um, the professor's wife, Grace Martin, called us up, and did we want to come and look at their basement apartment? And so we did, and turns out her husband, Boyd Martin, who was the dean of the College of Letters and Science, had grown up in Nespers. So we kind of had a connection there. And so we lived in the Martins' basement for that whole year, and ugh, we became like family to them, and they were wonderful people. The Martins dedicated their whole life to the causes of um, stopping war and creating peace in the world. And so they started a whole Martin Institute, which um, is at the University of Idaho now, and Mike's on the board. He was one of the founding members. and. So, and yeah, the Martins were wonderful. We finished up that year, and then lo and behold, Mike, who didn't, never tired of going to school, decided he wanted to go to law school. So I was starting, well, I guess I better look around for a job, and I got a job as a librarian, English teacher in Potlatch. So we got a little apartment out in Potlatch, and lived there. I taught in Potlatch. So after two years in Potlatch, we'd been married five years by that time, and we thought, oh, maybe it's time to have a child. So I got pregnant, and I had to choose. Did I want to keep teaching when I had a little baby, or nah? I'm like, I don't really want to do that. So I quit, and we bought a trailer house in Moscow, and then um, Jake was born in 1974 in October, and Mike was finishing his last year of law school. So Mike had been, during the summers, he'd come down here and work for Lauren Knutson, who was a lawyer here, as kind of an intern or, you know, a helper. And so we had to decide where did we want to live. Uh, we decided to come here, and Mike went to work for Lauren. And we bought a little house right up the hill. We um, had had enough money to buy the trailer outright when we were in Moscow. Sold the trailer, bought the house. So we didn't really have any house payments. We just sold the trailer, bought the house. Three and a half years later, our daughter Malia was born, 1978, in March. I stayed home, and um, a friend of ours, um, we had uh, made friends with the Stillmans, who lived out on um, Central Ridge, about 20 miles from town, and they had kids the same age as ours, pretty much. And so I, we became friends with them, and Carol was uh, kind of a go-getter, so she always got me into doing things like mini 4-H, and we did th lots of things like that. Then in about 1982, 
they decided to open a library here in Nespers because we hadn't had a library for a long time. When I was a kid, we always went to the bookmobile. And um, I must say, both of my parents were um, literary. My dad read all the time. He had, we never were without a newspaper. And we had magazines. My mom had magazines all the time. And she always took us to the bookmobile. Every two weeks, faithfully, we'd go to the bookmobile. And Carol said, well, you should apply to be the librarian. I'm like, oh, OK. So I did. The library was open like 12 hours a week. And it was, the library was set up in the city hall, which was this little tiny room down about two blocks down the street from here. And so um, my job was to go down to the headquarters of the library in Lap or in Lewiston at the time and pick out the books. So, and I had enough library science courses that I was certified as a school librarian. So I went down to Lewiston to pick out books and I was in the children's section picking out books and I said to the director whose name was Ed Linkhart, I said, Ed, these kids are not going to read these books because they're ugly, they have bad covers, and nobody's going to be attracted and want to read these books. And he said, oh, well, why don't you just order some then? Tell us what to order. So I got some uh, school school library journal and I got and some other books and I started ordering books and I really think that was the beginning of the libraries getting a lot of really good children's books in. In about 1985 I think um, the school um, needed a paraprofessional to be the librarian at the school and Carol said oh you should you should apply for that job. So I went up there and I applied and I said, well, I've got this other job at the city library and I don't want to give it up. And they go, okay, we'll hire two people and you can be half time, we'll do half time and, and then be the librarian for half time. So I did that for quite a few years. And so I started off at the school being a paraprofessional is what they call it now in, in the library. And next thing I knew, I was the counselor because I had a counseling degree. And so I did that with the library. And then the next thing I knew, I was teaching some English classes because the English teacher decided she didn't want to do it anymore. So then I got two English classes. <laughs> and so then I was half time at the school and then I did, and I did the library. And finally, the, one of the superintendents said, um, when are you going to go full-time? When are we going to have you full-time? And I, I finally um, gave up the library and went to full-time at the school. And at first I taught um, 11th and 12th grade English. And that was, uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, and then gradually, by the time I quit, I was teaching all four grades of English and being the counselor. And then the librarian retired, so I was the librarian. But I really didn't have time to do much <laughs> except be involved with the city library and get the school to interact with them. And that, that was a big, because the school library didn't have many books and didn't really have a very big budget. So um, we did a lot of work together with the school and the, and the city, so that was good. So I have tons of stories from my teaching, which I absolutely loved. Our superintendent now, Sean Teagues, is one of my former students, and he wasn't, he didn't like to write. It wasn't his thing, and so um, he went to college and became a science teacher. Now he's a superintendent, and he Frequently, we'll tell the kids, he goes, I always, you should listen to Mrs. Wasco when she tells you that you need to learn how to write because no matter what you do, you have to write. And he writes all the time now as a superintendent. So it's real, that's really gratifying to get that feedback that, yeah, I was right, that you do need to learn how to write because it'll come back in your, in your uh, future.
you'll need to, no matter what you want to do. So then another one of my former students, Melanie Krantz, came to get to apply for a job at Nespers as the seventh and eighth grade English teacher, and we hired her. And she and I just meshed. It was just, you know, we worked together on everything. For probably the last 10 years of my career. And we tried to get our curriculum, you know, um, met across the board from 7 through 12. And we just did all kinds of, of things. And it was, it was really, really fun. We, we just got along so well. And that, that's the epitome of being a teacher, I think, is having a partner that you can work well with. A big, big, big part of my um, teaching career was I became the uh, academic team's coach in about 1991 or two, I can't remember. Um, and uh, I always loved quiz, quizzes. I liked to watch Quiz Bowl on TV, and I loved quizzes. So um, uh, the, the math teacher in Kamii had started this Knowledge Bowl and all the schools would come together once a month and have a knowledge bowl competition. I absolutely I loved it. And people would say, how come you're coaching the math and science knowledge bowls? And I said, because nobody else wants to do it, and I love it. So I did it. I still go help with the knowledge bowl. I help write questions. I love to write questions. Um, for Melanie's the coach now, Melanie Kranz, and she'll call me up. I need some questions, and so I help her write questions, and I sometimes go up and judge, be help be the judge and, and whatnot. So, so that's a really fun thing. But I'm, I remember thinking, I'm 65 years old, and I still love this. This is great. Well, uh, about three, or f three years later, um, I was at school one day, and Mary Ulhorn, the school secretary, said, did you change your makeup or something? Because your face looks kind of orange. And I went home, I said, Mike, is my face orange? Yeah. So I went to the doctor, and something went wrong with my liver. And next thing I knew, I was in Seattle at the University of Washington Hospital, and they were trying to figure out what was wrong. I was over there for a month, and that's when I decided, I guess, I'm 70 years old, it's time to retire, <laughs> so. So Madeline was born in 19, 2005, so she was our first grandchild. And about six months later in September, Jillian, Jake and Jamie had Jillian. So then we had Megan, and the next year we had Jonah, our first boy. He belongs to Jake and Jamie. We had four grandkids, and Jeremy and Malia had two girls, and we were like, they probably want to have a boy sometime. And so then Malia got pregnant, and we thought, okay, maybe we'll get another boy. Well, no. We got Josie, and she is, <laughs> she's quite the character. It's fun having grandkids. I didn't know it was going to be so much fun. Now I can text them. The only one that doesn't have a phone is Jonah. So... I, I'll text them and they'll text me back and that's that's kind of fun. I don't try not to do it too often because, oh, it's my grandma again. <laughs> Love who you are and what you do. Um, don't be afraid to do your own thing and don't give up and don't, you know, um, just be your own self, I'd say. Don't, don't worry about what other people think. So that's my advice.